This has always been a breeding ground of unusual religious movements in addition to mainstream religious movements. Humans have a spiritual need. They need the spirituality as much as their food. I think this area that you're talking about, I think this is a really interesting idea. And ultimately, I think what it means is that it's a sacred site. Just, it's a sacred site. There are places on the earth that are more sacred than others. And we, we feel that. We don't really rationalize that or cognize that. We feel it. This is the last footage I ever shot of my father. He died two weeks later. As a teenager, death became a prominent theme in my life, as my father was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer which slowly and eventually took him away from us. I watched him pass away in peace. I remember he had a smile on his face. I observed his journey closely, and I watched him handle the struggle with strength and grace. His ideas on spirituality were oftentimes intense and many times misunderstood, but it was the unseen which brought him solace and comfort. In my youth, I constantly wondered what that was. What brought him peace during those darkest moments? I had no idea how much his journey would affect me later on in my life, until I found myself in Beechwood Canyon. A quaint neighborhood located directly underneath the Hollywood sign, which appeared to offer some answers to all the questions I'd lived with since his passing. A cluster of profound spiritual institutions and communities, all within arm's length of one another. What drew all of these spiritual thinkers and movements to this location? During the 2020 global pandemic, when anxiety of death was heightened to a whole new extreme, Beechwood Canyon and the immediate surrounding neighborhoods appeared to be a place where one could find answers, calm their fears of the uncertain, and spiritually grow. In an area riddled by misperception, contradiction, and mystery, the stark contrast between the material and the spiritual realms couldn't be more apparent than they are here. Little did I know the profound truths that would be uncovered on this journey. People come to LA because it's the entertainment industry, film and TV primarily, and let's, it's a fantasy factory, it's not real. And people have to pretend that there's somebody they're not in order to, uh, to make it in this town. So I think you lose who you are pretty well. And so in Beechwood in particular, because it's under the Hollywood sign, so there is this living the myth that I still get a kick out of. And then you find it, the spiritual vacuum and I think they need the spirituality to go with it. It feels like there <laughs> must be some sort of energy that's there. You know, you could say it's some kind of vortex or some kind of energy. When you look at the lays of land where chi or energy gathers and accumulates, it follows a very specific formula. In reading some of the Chinese literature, there's always a hill. It comes in like a grail or a cup. If you study acupuncture, they teach you that there are these points on your body. The earth is the same. It has like acupuncture points, okay? So if we understand that we're a microcosm of the planet Earth and the universe, everything works the same way. Yeah, Los Angeles has always uh, been a place for seekers, at least with the advent of Euro-American settlers to the region. So we have all these records of people saying, if you come here, you'll get healed. And I had uh, consumption or, or TB, and I came to Southern California, and now I can breathe, that kind of stuff. 
And, you know, they're not wrong. That's the beauty of boosterism, is you take a little kernel of truth and then you expand it. So people came here in droves. And I think one of the advantages that LA has had in developing an extraordinary spiritual landscape is that it had existed for generations as an agricultural town. And when newcomers arrived, they had to create things themselves. And when you do that, an extraordinary creativity gets unleashed. There's the Rosicrucian Fellowship, there's Theosophy, there's Katana, there's Self-Realization Fellowship, Vedanta Center. Hmm. There's something going on here. When we look at the history of Hollywood, I think the central question to ask is, why is the place where we make our new media also a place that has such an incredible spiritual charge? Why is it both those things at once? One of the benefits of being in Los Angeles is that like, we have access to like, all of these lineages of all of these different groups, and especially within the theosophical, like the 19th century theosophical movement, right? Like pretty much all of the, the factions are represented here in some way. And so I don't think there's another place in the world where that's the case. You know, the really interesting question is like, okay, well, like, what happened? European, Euro-American sacred sites are built on older sacred sites. So when Catholicism reigned, they didn't create new sacred sites, they used the old sacred sites. It's a brilliant and terrible move, <laughs> but I mean, if you want to eliminate the previous religion, you build on top of it, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't prevent the sacredness of the site from coming through. In fact, it can appropriate it. The Tongva or Gabrielino people uh, lived in this place. They have evidence going all the way back to around 10,000 BC. So they spent a lot of time cultivating the land. Rock, wind, and rain shaped the mountains, valleys, and islands of Tawangar. The first people were rock, tree, eagle, and coyote. Since creation time, the people gathered to process acorns for food. They wove baskets to collect the food that will sustain them through the winter. They walked along paths their ancestors had shown them. They gathered to eat, sing, and share stories. They lived in balance with all the relatives. The land remembers. I think one of the reasons, well, first of all, you got to look a little bit as Southern California as a whole was a mecca for free thinkers and a mecca for folks coming out to seek a different way of life. Health seekers, nudists, right? Uh, fringe religions, cults, they all started to come out here in the late 19th century. There, there are many possible reasons for this. One of them that I find very interesting is Carrie McWilliams in his book, Southern California, An Island Upon the Land. He says that there was this enormous boosterism about Southern California, and there was. I mean, we sold Southern California to the rest of the country, right? And we sold it based on a novel called Ramona, Helen Hunt Jackson's fictive account of a San Gabrielino native person and a white person and their love, which is, is kind of a Romeo and Juliet story. And it, it's a novel, it's not real, but people came here in the late 19th century to see the sights of the novel. I always tell people, watch for these migratory flows in America, because wherever you see these migratory flows, that's always where the new religious movements are going to appear, because people are uprooting themselves, they're leaving behind the congregations or family ties or religious commitments that they had wherever they came from and they are a ripe constituency for new religious ideas. There's lots of other things. Boosterism that talks about Southern California as paradisical, kind of Eden. If you go to certain places on the earth if you're a feeling person, if you know how to feel and sense things, if you haven't been totally deadened, when you go to certain places, you can feel that they have a very specific feeling. The 
temperature inside is the same as the temperature outside and the the light just seems omnipresent and always available you, you're not facing what we today would call the winter doldrums or seasonal affective disorder or feeling that you have to coop up inside and and, and hibernate like like we do on the east coast or like some of our ancient ancestors did in the late 19th century there was no medical infrastructure here so people came to get healed just by the climate and cool you know it is a pretty awesome climate and it you feel better right but you still get illnesses that cannot be treated by the climate so mcwilliams thesis is that having no doctors in the region you have to fix yourself you have to heal yourself and so you sought what was available and that was you know alternative medicine there's certainly something about Beechwood Canyon that has lured folks with higher ideals. I think you start to realize that probably this has been going on here for way longer. That the, Be the Beechwood Canyon version of it is just the newest version of something that's been happening here. People have been living on this site for as long as there have been modern humans in this part of the world. This was probably, you know, a sacred site long before any of this happened. So, you know, I suspect that like, um, you know, we are, we are just the latest version of something that's been happening in this area for a really long time. When Madame Blavatsky wrote her two-volume opus, The Secret Doctrine, in 1888, she made reference to the fact that the next stage in planetary evolution would occur uh, in America. She was in a very specific state of consciousness when she wrote it, and so it kind of like, it's so obviously amazing, but a little arduous to read. Unless, I had at that point already finished reading the alchemy stuff, and I had a background in science, so I was familiar with a lot of the stuff she was talking about, because she talks a lot about evolutionary theory in there. Mrs. Besant, H.P. Uh, Blavatsky's successor, uh, took that to mean, because of several other references, that she was speaking specifically about the West Coast and about the state of California. The Theophysis wanted somewhere that was, you know, magnetically right, that, that was energetically right, and they definitely seemed to feel all of that at Beechwood Canyon. The uh, sort of the, the leading light was a man by the name of Mr. Warrington, and it is in Beechwood Canyon right around the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century, that a big theosophical colony was established with the Greek name of Crotona. The name Crotona comes from Pythagoras and the Pythagorean uh, utopian community. So they took the name Crotona and were practicing a utopian vision, much like uh, the Pythagoreans did. Crotona was meant to be the American center of the Theosophical Society. It was a big establishment. There was not much else going on. Uh, in, in Beechwood Canyon. You look at Crotona and the folks who designed it, these people were culturally savvy and culturally very, very in the know. Mead and Requia, the Heinemans, they really used top tier architects who had really forward ways of thinking and uh, ways of doing things that were beyond just uh, technical drawings. They really had a kind of magical theory of architecture and what it could be. And when people would come here, there was nothing else around. So you could see the ocean, the smell of all the flowers and the fresh, you know, eucalyptus trees they planted. It was just something that was extraordinary. What is their level of activity? and what kind of activities are happening. It was supposed to be a place that people could move to, come together and live these very kind of like aesthetically pure lifestyles, right? They were vegetarians, they were vegans, uh, they prayed, they meditated. Uh, they were very, very involved in artistic endeavors. You know, everything that was done at Katona was done with intention. Every, everything was done with intention. When they laid the cornerstones here, People from everywhere around the world gathered together to meditate, to pray, to send energy here. Everything they did when they built the dome, the dome was built with sacred geometry, precisely facing the, the, the altar facing the east to draw out the world teacher who would be Krishnamurti. They said that, you know, the dome was magnetically charged. I think those, uh, 
intentions that they laid down here are like energy fields that are very much still implanted in this place. It had its own trends and had its own like, you know, now in 1908 we're really interested in talking about cult chemistry. The main um, dialogue that's coming out of the leaders of the society is all about their clairvoyant investigation of biology and that ultimately and they publish essays in the Theosophist and in the different regional journals and so the members are reading this stuff and then that's what they're talking about. They were actually very, very, very interested in education. They would have speakers come in and talk about esoteric thought, about you know Eastern religions that a lot of people that time didn't know about and people were really welcome to come in and learn these ideas and you don't get any sense that folks were pressured to, to join Cortona or the Theosophical Society. One of the things about understanding this relationship is understanding what these people were actually like, the specific conversations they were having during their lifetimes at these particular moments. But it was really kind of like a college environment. And somebody talked about coming there and expecting to see all these gurus, you know, and instead it was all these like very pretty ladies in like long flowy dresses, you know. It had, it had a lot of kind of performative aspects. The events that were happening here were definitely influencing the conversations that the theosophists in Central and Eastern Europe were having in the 1910s and 19 teens. There was a moment, at least in terms of like American and European art, where you, you know, everybody was in some ways engaging or thinking about these conversations or reading books, the books that were being published and released by different theosophical organizations. There were thresholds to those places that you had to cross. It does contain a secret society. That's also one of the dynamics of this, right? Like you see the society, but there is of course, this, there are esoteric sections. There is this dialogue that happens a lot in the early days of society that somehow that they're independent structures that like what the esoteric schools do is somehow supposed to be separate and distinct from what the society does. I think trying to argue the reality of that is very hard. All of this goes back to what the kind of like leadership at the turn of the 20th century was doing and how they were structuring things and how they were organizing this new spiritual movement. It's murky. So Hollywood is primarily uh, created by a woman named Daida Wilcox. And Daida Wilcox believed in Hollywood being this temperate oasis of art and culture and Christianity and beauty and gardens. Uh, the famous Paul de Longpre Garden was the first tourist attraction in Hollywood. It, it was all about this kind of genteel, natural beauty. in the early studios come in and you see somewhere like the Hollywood Hotel which was on Hollywood Boulevard as we know it now about where Hollywood and Highland is that had started off as this sprawling country estate hotel uh, to take in folks on uh, genteel vacations but it turns into by the late teens and 20s a place where fast talking you know kind of shady movie folks were coming out from New York to check out this place called Hollywood and they would stay at the Hollywood Hotel. And then you had people coming out to do acting gigs at these rough and tumble studios in Hollywood and they're staying at the Hollywood Hotel. And the character of it completely changes. And that to me really is indicative of Hollywood as a whole and Beachwood as a whole. And you have thousands of folks flooding in from all over the country thinking they can change their lives here in Hollywood. Crotona leaves in the early 1920s. They, they, the Crotona Institute already sees the way things are going in Hollywood, right? And they are not into this consumerist, glitzy, dirty lifestyle that's happening, especially already on Hollywood Boulevard below and with some of the early studios. And part of the, uh, the theosophists who were living here in the canyon then moved with the new Crotona to Ojai, California. Quite a few of them remained in residence here. 
and then uh, they in turn formed uh, Besant Lodge, named after Dr. Rani Besant, who was the the president of the society, the leader at that time. And so that gives way for the folks uh, who were part of the consortium who decided to build uh, Hollywoodland to really come in. After the Theosophists left in 1924, uh, Cretona was sold to Rupert Julian, a silent film actor and director. Uh, while he lived here, he directed Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera, biggest film of its time. And his wife, Elsie Jane Wilson, was a pioneer in the women's film movement. So after the Theosophists left, this sort of creativity and movie sort of um, energy was here for 20 years they they lived here uh, they turned this place into an inn they turned the temple into lofts when you look at the registrar that is here at Cretona pretty much every person artist actor of the day when they came to Hollywood stayed here so that went on for another 20 years after the Theosophists left as part of the movie magic of of this area so I don't think Cretona can be underestimated in any way as to the birth of uh, film and the birth of great ideas. One of the truly remarkable things about Cretona is that it really ties into the metaphysical element of the creation of Hollywood. We take films for granted uh, these days, but I would imagine back then this magical idea of being able to visualize your dreams and, and capture your dreams must have been such a beautiful notion and to see that unfolding and its abilities to create film. So I think of the filmmaking as quite metaphysical in that way, and so Cretona was very much uh, a part of that. One of the things that I think is we are really obsessed about at this moment in our culture at this time, right, is of course like, and it's something I think that is a perennial human condition is uh, our subjectivity, right, like our, our individual identity, right, the, the reinforcement of our ego perspective. You know, for me as a student of spirituality, you know, when I see that dynamic happening, like this is not, this is a very familiar conversation. That of course, when you let, when you let people just be their embodied selves, th th that's what we always gravitate towards. We always gravitate towards uh, our individual uh, reinforcement of our identity, reinforcement of our subjectivity, reinforcement of our ego perspective. How do we connect to the transpersonal? How do we get you out of your subjective experience for a little bit of a moment? How do we suggest? How do how do we kind of remind everybody that like? Um, you, you know, this is you are really transient, and all of the positions that you're certain are the most important things in the world will will be gone, and and other ones will replace them. So there must be some other perspective that we can find to think about our condition and our experience, and and that's you know that is literally like the definition I think of um, of spiritual knowledge is that is like the the first step. Vedanta is, uh, means Vedas, means knowledge, and Anta means end, and so you put them together, you get the, uh, the end of the Vedas or the end of knowledge, and you can, it's kind of a double meaning. You could say that it refers to the Upanishads, and the Upanishads are the 
philosophical portions that occur in the Vedas, which are the scriptures of Indian philosophy and religion. So in that sense, the Upanishads are the end of the Vedas. Or you could say it's the culmination of knowledge that one gets from studying the Vedas. And, and both interpretations work. The mission of the Ramakrishna order in, in general is uh, for the uh, spiritual realization of the individual and for uh, for helping the world. Our mission here particularly is focused on providing uh, philosophical instruction and spiritual instruction uh, so that people can get a philosophical background to understand uh, the how the spiritual practices work and then know what the spiritual practices are to actually do them. There had been kind of a fledgling Vedanta group in Los Angeles ever since San Francisco Swamis used to come down and, and visit. And Swami Vivekananda, of course, had, had been lecturing in 1900. Terry Mead Wyckoff decided that she would really like Swami Parmananda to come to Los Angeles and start a center. And she was living in this home. Her brother had died, her son had died. So she was pretty much alone. And so uh, he, he came down to Southern California and started the center in December of 29. Uh, and so it was really because of uh, Mrs. Wyckoff living in this house as we happened to end up here. But when you know that she had known Swami Vivekananda, perhaps uh, there was some uh, divine intervention there that they wanted to send her somewhere here. Uh, when Gerald Hurd spoke here, and he spoke here later on too, uh, then Gerald Hurd and his close friend Aldous Huxley uh, were quite involved uh, for a time at least with the Vedanta Society. Those three people, Aldous Huxley, Gerald Hurd and Christopher Isherwood, were all pacifists uh, and they were uh, friends with each other and, and I think it was Gerald Hurd that by accident kind of ran into Swami Prabhupada and then of course they were already fairly well-known authors co really coming right into their prime period of uh, creativity and uh, renown. They of course helped uh, Swami Prabhupada a lot with the magazine, they contributed articles to it and uh, Christopher Ishwood helped edit some of the books for him. His involvement in the Vedanta Society brought it to a huge number of people and awareness. Um, certainly he, he was an amazing individual. He made so much for gay rights movements. Like he was like a total champion and a hero. So they were quite instrumental in, in bringing an, an expertise of English letters to the Vedanta Center. When the Theosophists left, roughly 10 years later, the nuns, the Dominican nuns came and bought the property that is right behind me here. And these are Dominican, these Dominican nuns are, are cloistered nuns. So they do not participate in the outside world. They do not leave the convent and go into the modern world at all. They pray from dawn till dusk and they pray for all of us. And the important thing to remember about traditional prayer is that it serves a very, very strong purpose, much like chanting Sanskrit that the Vedanta community does to the left of Cretona. You know, traditional prayer is saying words that have been said billions and billions of times over the centuries with divine intention and divine will and devotion. And they create these energy fields, really, that you step into, that when you pray the same words, they have so much power because of that reason. That's why we have traditional prayer. So the nuns are here in Beechwood Canyon and have been since the 30s, praying all day, constantly, for us and the earth. I don't know if people really understand the enormity of that and what it contributes to this community and to this place in general. We must support these communities because they are constantly 
in touch with the unseen nature of life. Uh, much like the energy that we feel in um, this neighborhood. But whatever we want to consider it, the belief in a guardian angel has undoubtedly contributed a great deal to the moral growth of mankind. Manly P. Hall is esoteric himself. He's hidden to history. And part of our job is to make him more visible, but not him so much as his works. It is something we're all better for believing, whereas doubts and negative attitudes get, do nothing to help. They do not give us any further strength or insight with which to labor for the perfection of our society or the adva advancement of our own ethics. Manly P. Hall was a seeker from a very early age. He spent much of his life bopping around the American West with his grandmother. And he lived for a while in New York City and worked on Wall Street for a while. Saw the, the acuity of what was happening there. This would have been right before the crash. His grandmother unexpectedly died. Having nowhere else to turn, he came to Santa Monica. He was 19, so Canadian, uh, living with his grandmother, no father, mother in on the other side of the continent. And I imagine him getting off the train at Union Station with his suitcase and his questions. When he reached Southern California, he found a home, more or less, with some of the new religious movements and spiritual organizations that existed there, including the Rosicrucian Fellowship, uh, the Theosophical Lodges. These were places where a person could study, a person could read, a person could congregate, a person could find a certain degree of fellowship. But now he's here. Now, this is what we're talking about, right? This space. So now he's here. He's not in Ontario. He's not in New York. He's here. And he flourishes. And the guardian angel says, don't forget. Understand. And if you do that, you will probably find that you can transform the injury into soul power and soul growth. And when you do that, the guardian angel will pat you lightly on the back and let you know that you have succeeded in something. Because of the spiritual organizations that had already taken root there, a young Manly Hall could take root there. He had a place where he could borrow books, libraries that he could sit in, people that he could meet, a place, places to hone his skills as, as a speaker. So the early fertility of, of, of Southern California as a center of alternative religious activity, it gave Manly P. Hall a natural home. So he's at Cretona, um, he's downtown at Trinity Auditorium, and he, be, he gets a call to be the minister of the Church of the People. I hope you can hear. Have you been able to hear us up so far? Uh, one hand went up in the back, that one heard. This, this was a church that was that traces its lineage back to Ralph Waldo Emerson. So already, right, we're into a very different kind of American religion, one that's attuned to the deeper meanings that aren't obvious and aren't especially institutional. They're trans-institutional. They go everywhere, right? They're not doctrinal and held. And, and so he starts to speak there and because it's the Church of the People and it's Ralph Waldo Emerson, he's talking about the Upanishads. He's talking about uh, the Quran. He's talking about everything. And people just start to flock to him. Well, we have a rather curious subject this morning, but I think it is one that has meaning and considerable contemporary significance. Now, what, what I find really interesting is he had a lot of competition then. So, 1920s, Los Angeles, 1930s, who's, who's there? What's happening? Amy Simple McPherson is happening, Sister Amy, and lots of others like her. Within that mix emerges Manly Palmer Hall, who is different. He's different because he's read everything. He's read everything, like stuff I've never heard of, and I have a PhD in religion and philosophy, and I'd never heard of some of this stuff because it's hidden, right? He remembers everything. I think he probably had a photographic memory because he could just 
in, the, in his lectures, all this was available to him, just right at his fingertips, and he could pull down whatever. It is therefore very good at this time to kind of try to make, make an acquaintance of this character in yourself. Try to find the guardian angel. All you have to do to find it is to be quiet for a moment and think a beautiful thought, and it's there. And he had the audacity to be a brilliant teacher and communicator. A promising newcomer who was preternaturally talented as a speaker, later as a writer, who seemed to have this really remarkable facility with esoteric ideas that went beyond his, his age, his maturity, his traditional education. He was 28 or something when he wrote that big book. <laughs> the secret teachings of all ages. Not only did he have a place to gestate as a thinker, uh, based on all the new religious groups that were popping up in California, but the place was not yet so large, the place was not yet so formidable uh, that uh, you would get lost in a crowd. He didn't get lost in a crowd, he stood out. Mr. Hall went to Andy Besant and said, look, look, Dr. Besant, you know, I am, I am for all intents and purposes one of you people. I revere Madame Blavatsky, I, you know, I study all these things. Do you think I should work within the Theosophical Society? Would there be a place for me? And Annie Besson thought and he said, and she was a very honest, honorable woman. And she looked at him and said, Mr. Hall, you'll do much better on your own. You should have your own school and do your own teachings, and that will be the best for you. And I well, said, thank you very much. He begins to lecture all over now, not just Los Angeles, all over the world. In the 40s, he lectures at Carnegie Hall. He lectures in Tokyo and London. When we bought this building, the first public lecture given here was given by Manly Hall. And he spoke for two and a half hours without taking a breath without any notes, without stopping, and every sentence perfectly formed, every word perfectly pronounced, and I said, eh, this man is the, is the eighth wonder of the world, you know, I've never, never heard anything like that. And he stood out among people who had resources, who were willing to fund the development of the Philosophical Research Society, who were willing to fund Manley's travels, Manley's collection of artifacts, Manley's collection of rare volumes in his library. They wanted LA to have a proper culture and they saw Manley among other figures as uh, people who could make that happen. And Mr. Warrington was very friendly with Mr. Hall and he uh, gave Mr. Hall some sources that the Theosophical Society's library had that, that Mr. Hall didn't have. So he was, he was very helpful to Mr. Hall in the early years. And he travels the world, and he travels the world picking up rare books. Okay, so in the 20s and 30s, a rare book isn't what it is now, 100 years later, right? So they didn't see it as rare, necessarily. They saw it as weird, uh, you know, and it was like, oh, you know, here's some hermetic something, you know, and so, but Manly knew. He knew what they had, and so he would buy it, ship it back, and it became this. In the beginning. In 1934, the Philosophical Research Society was incorporated as a nonprofit educational institution with charitable, religious, and educational privileges. Shortly thereafter, the corporation was able to secure the valuable property on which its buildings now stand. Although the nation was in the midst of a disastrous depression, the first unit of our construction was possible because of the low building costs. In the early morning of October 17, 1935, nearly 100 persons assembled in a field of wild mustard on the corner of Griffith Park and Los Feliz Boulevards in Los Angeles for the purpose of breaking ground for the headquarters of the Philosophical Research Society. There was a threat of rain in the air, but at the significant moment, 
the stars were shining brightly. Well, there was a man, he's an architect at that time who was a singular figure in all this. He was a little crazy, I think, but crazy like in a good way. And his name is Robert Stacy Judd. Judd was an extraordinary architect who created a campus for Manly Hall that was both responsive to contemporary style, but also reflected perennial themes. We have the original drawings and it was going to be a Mayan temple. I mean, we're here on this busy corner in Los Feliz and we're kind of up on a hill already, but the plan was for this massive <laughs> Mayan temple to dominate Los Feliz. And uh, I wistfully think sometimes about what it would be like to be president of such a place. You know, I'd be up in the tower you know, alone, contemplate. And I often say that PRS is the most epic, intimate space in America. When you enter the campus, it's just a breathtaking experience. You feel like you're in this kind of remarkably pro proportioned and designed cloister. And yet it is a cloister. It's a relatively small place, but it doesn't feel small when you're standing in the center of it. The intimacy doesn't reduce the scale of the splendid, really extraordinary, timeless architecture that Judd created. I don't think there's any other structure like it in the United States, not that I've visited. That library, in terms of a collection of um, focused material, is probably one of the best ones in the United States. Like, I feel like you would have to go to Europe uh, to some of the like uh, hermetic libraries or um, places like that to get a collection with as many of those uh, volumes in one place. The idea from the beginning was to make these works and these teachings and this wisdom available to everyone. He built this whole place as a center for education and as a place for people to come and on their path, where they can find the resources they need on their path to wisdom. At a very early date, it became evident that the human being was in serious difficulty trying to understand where he was, what he was, and why he was. He looked around him and he saw a nature unfolding but behind this nature, as he saw it, there must be something else. But he had no way of really trying to discover what it was. Initially, you could come in and look at the material. You couldn't check anything out, but anyone, any member of the public could come and read these amazing books and educate themselves without having to be a scholar. Elvis Presley frequented the PRS. So another feature of Manley that kind of relates to your previous question is he was very collaborative and he welcomed Stefan in and made him a teacher, a co-teacher, right away. Now Heller's coming from Hungary under the Nazis and <laughs> under Stalin, and he, so he's looking for a special kind of openness and freedom. And so he comes here and meets Manly Hall and they hit it off. I knew of the Philosophical Research Society even before I moved to Los Angeles, I knew of Manly Hall. So we introduced ourselves to him, told him that we were on the Theosophical Society. So what can I show you? Well, I said, anything you think that would be interesting, you know. So we went not to, he opened up the vault for us with the original editions of H.P. Blavatsky's uh, Secret Doctrine and with the personal notes of H.P.B. Uh, and all sorts of things like that, which he, which he figured would be of particular interest to you. And oh, I said, these things are fabulous, and these things are wondrous. They asked me to start lecturing over there. I really find that admirable, and it goes to the previous point about him not seeking fame for himself. If, if you want to corner the market, say, on Esoterica, you don't ask for help from other powerful figures. For some very curious reason, from my childhood, in fact, from my early childhood, 
I had a, a, a unquenchable interest in the Gnostics. And there wasn't much available about them, you know. So every encyclopedia, every book, we had a big library at my parents' home too, you know, and always looked up things in the Gnostics. Also, I found out that one about the closest uh, philosophy that contained a great deal of material from ancient Gnosticism was Theosophy. That is why I joined the Theosophical Society, because of, because of its Gnostic uh, connection. What uh, magic has always tried to accomplish was to um, uh, engage in certain practices which would increase the awareness, the consciousness of the greater, of the inner world. I had a kind of a little experience about 1952. A friend and I went up uh, to the Griffith Observatory on a beautiful New Year's Day, sunshine, marvelous uh, weather. And I looked out over the city and you could see clear down to the ocean by Santa Monica, you know. I went into a kind of reverie, in Jungian psychology we call it active imagination. And it was to the effect that uh, I, I was looking down toward the ocean on a different city. And there were towers and I could hear bells, uh, you know, with my inner ear. So what the heck is this? And so I kind of asked in my mind and said, this is the new Alexandria. And then later on, at, at, at some point when we were alone, I told Mr. Hall about that. Well, he said, my friend, whatever you, whatever you saw at that time, you saw right. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the most telling aspects of Los Angeles and as a spiritual center, and this area as a spiritual sacred site, was from Manley, because as early as the 30s, he's talking, 1930s, he's talking about Los Angeles as a place, uh, as a place for a revival of the, the old understandings of life and meaning and love and everything else. To study our heritage from the past is not simply a waste of time because most of that heritage is still with us. If not in the political and social circles of life, at least in the internal subjective moods of our own existence. He was like a straight line, you know? So it's not like he was pulled toward one thing or pulled toward another. So my guess is that he was just manly and people came to him and he remained manly, right? And so, you know, there could be a sense of rejection because of that, right? Because I, I need you to be this. And he, like, there are people who wanted him to be a guru. And he, he just, he said, I'm not your guru. You, you must find your own way. The human being has an occult, a transcendental, a mystical corner in his soul. And uh, there, there never was a time when there was no occult and uh, uh, you know, transcendental movement in the world or in Western culture for that matter. Something was wrong. The uh, great search ended in a frustration, not in a great reward which they had hoped for. What did happen? Why is this sudden block that is um, impossible for most people to get through. And the final decision it was that this block was the absence of a faculty higher than the mind. The mind could only go a certain distance. Even though the most beautifully trained the mind, it could not fulfill the ultimate. It's almost like philosophy and metaphysics is more of an art form than a truth form, right? Because if it's a truth form, then you have a decision to make, right? Is this the truth? 
If it is, I must abandon this that I was believing, and I must act according to this. You don't see that in L.A. Um, it's more like, oh, that's a really interesting idea. That's a really beautiful idea. And honestly, I, I feel like I would be happy with that. If, if we could see metaphysics in the search in terms of art rather than truth claims. Because art provides meaning. But truth, at least as the academic philosophers understood it, is a pretty brutal master. As a, an artist who's interested in trying to understand like, how, can these, uh, how can this metaphysical conversation be picked up again, you know, for me, the, the desire to engage with the Theosophical Society and the Theosophical Doctrine and its history is in a sense that like, that's the last place where there is an overt, clean connection where you can point back to and you can see the one-to-one -one relationship between this metaphysical um, conversation in terms of art and the work of practicing artists. I'm a writer who found spirituality in Hollywood of all places, <laughs> specifically Buddhism. I feel like a California cliche having moved here from New York, um, burnt out and cynical, a heavy New Yorker, and within a year I was a Buddhist in California and proud to be one. The Buddhism I'm talking about is Nichiren Buddhism, nam ho renge kyo that's what we chant, and there are 23 of us within walking distance in this neighborhood. Uh, but I was found myself in a spiritual vacuum, and uh, I had many losses within 48 hours. Uh, my beloved dog had died. I got stung by a wasp, and I almost died. My agent in New York died, and my agent in LA quit the business, all in 48 hours. I lost like, all my support system and everything. And I thought, this is why people you know, go, help me, help me. But I had nobody. So I decided to embrace this practice. I'm the kind of person when I commit to something, I really commit to it. And I committed to um, this sect of Buddhism, Nichiren Buddhism, and I've been doing it for 19 years, twice a day for 19 years, and it has really made a difference in my life. My interest in weird things, <laughs> metaphysics, the occult, unexplained phenomenon, um, witchcraft, it's, I'm kind of a lifer uh, because it started when I was little, I would get sick a lot. I was always very ill. I had severe asthma and bronchitis and so I would have out of body experiences. I had a dream when I was three years old. This was, unbeknownst to me, this was a very Gnostic image. I remember my first one, I was two years old, and I had terrible pneumonia because of my bronchial tubes. And I, my mom was sleeping in my bed with me because I was so sick and she was worried. And I remember coming up out of my body and I was on the ceiling watching my body and my mom next to me. And I told my mom about it when I woke up. And that's one of the things that actually I think helps me remember because I told her the story and then she would also tell me about it later. So uh, she was like, what, what did you just say? And I was like, I saw you sleeping with me from the ceiling. And I asked her, I go, do we have an attic? 
And she goes, what, what do you mean? And I go, I think I was in the attic because I was looking from above down on us. And she was like, no, baby, we don't have an attic. I told the dream of obviously to my parents and a couple of other people. It was a Sunday morning when I woke up and we had our own chapel in our old place. And so the priest was there who had just said mass. Then my father encouraged me to tell the dream in front of the priest whose interpretation undoubtedly was a little different from others, but still, um, and the priest said, oh, the Holy Spirit inspires little children sometimes, and, you know, things like that. In any event, uh, then uh, sometime later, not very much, I, I must, run, must have run into somebody and, uh, who said, well, that is uh, definitely a Gnostic team. So I knew then that something happened that was weird. And so I was like, huh. And I just would spend a lot of time in bed, uh, kind of not able to breathe. And I do feel like if you have experiences with death or sickness, you kind of get uh, an introduction to this kind of thing. So it became a kind of curiosity because I had to know or discover why was this happening to me and not to other people, right? Or what other people was this happening to and who else has had these kinds of experiences? I've found Beechwood to be a very elevating place to live. There's an incredible creative energy that's here, but there's an incredible spiritual energy that's here. And for those of us who are open to it and who have creative jobs, we can bring that incredibly potent spiritual energy into our work very quickly and very efficiently here. I landed in Beechwood Canyon at a very important change point in my own career. I am a poet and was a poet before, but the realization that peace, talking about peace, the arrival of peace and building new peace was going to be central to my creative life moving forward, that all happened soon after I arrived in Beechwood Canyon. I started to realize that my work was flowing more quickly here than it ever had before, and there were new themes arriving in my work. There are these incredibly charged, energetic places on the planet that are natural places of arrival, arrival for brand new ideas and new information. It's remarkable how many spiritual thinkers have lived in Los Angeles, considering how young of a place it is. Manly P. Hall and Yogananda and Louise Hay. I mean, the list just goes on and on. There is a light here and an energy here that draws people in. Prisms will emerge. We have this powerful vortex bringing brand new ideas and information into the world.
there absolutely was a convergence between Hollywood and the occult and esoteric, uh, 100%. Uh, this is evidenced in uh, many of the early filmmakers making movies that had to do with themes like Babylon. Everybody in the studios knew about Theosophy. Sometimes not by name. People talked about reincarnation, like they talked about what dinner they're gonna eat, <laughs> and uh, you know things like that. So it was Hollywood was very occultified, from what I could see. Here's what I personally have discovered: is that when you are overtly occult, uh, it's very dangerous. Then, if you, in a safe manner, speak about the occult. Uh, I had a lot of these issues interviewing scholars who had written books about the occult, about witchcraft, and then any time I asked them about their personal practices of the occult or witchcraft, I was promptly shut down. And whenever I would talk about that I was doing these things, that I was actually actively doing them and not just talking about them, somehow it crosses a kind of safety zone. And so for the outsiders who are willing to embody the teachings and practices, then you truly are taboo because suddenly no one wants anything to do with you until you prove or amass a certain amount of power. That's the way that these things operate because people are so uh, vanity driven and that to uh, possess a true occult power within your physical form, within your being, within your practices of daily life, uh, at least for me, I quickly did not give a shit who <laughs> knew or participated in it with me uh, because you don't need anything from anyone else. And so for an outsider to perform these and display them in a kind of ritualistic fashion or a way to convey, share, or open their practice to other people, uh, it's very vulnerable, uh, it's very dangerous, because of the um, Frankenstein mobs who are ignorant and judgmental and um, shockingly uh, offended by truth in any form. And so for outsiders, I salute them. <laughs> there are, are pockets of evangelical culture uh, on the West Coast that surely would view Theosophy or PRS or the Rosicrucian Lodges or the Freemasonic Lodges with, with some degree of suspicion. You know, you have a backlash that is partially cultural, partially a prejudice coming from uh, East Coast attitudes towards the development and growth of alternative spirituality. You have some backlash that grows out of the religious conservatism of the nation, although I, I don't think that made itself felt with any great force uh, in Southern California. And then you have just sort of the, you know, casual street corner, water cooler conversations about, gee, that's strange, what goes on there? And yet the fact is in Southern California, when you have a future president like Ronald Reagan, who's interested in numerology, astrology, and tarot, and he becomes a two-term governor, it's sort of hard to look askance at, you know, what they're doing over the next hedges because a lot of people in power are participating in some of the alternative spiritual or new age uh, ideas, methods, techniques themselves. You know, when you've got a future American president who, you know, publicly affirms that, yeah, he takes an interest in astrology, it's a little difficult to get too worked up about, you know, what's going on, uh, you know, on Los Feliz Boulevard. Theosophical societies were pretty accessible at certain levels, so they would have public events. Uh, the Passant and Leadbeater Lodge there, they would have seances um, at the location. So they were actively promoting this stuff. Um, death was never really addressed in my household growing up. It was never really um, any item that anybody in my family really discussed. Oh, it was something that happened to those people whose funerals that you went to, but it was never really something that we dwelled upon, so I really had to come upon the notion myself.
I don't like the word pandemic, so let's see what, what, what do we call it, an epidemic, a worldwide epidemic, and, and certainly that uh, uh, deserved uh, some serious attention and uh, caused a great deal of damage, um, especially at the psychological le level. So on top of the, uh, the physical damage of the, of the sicknesses and the death, we have now, I think, uh, 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 a psychologically fairly seriously damaged populace, which uh, may or which damage may or may not be undone if we are lucky. When we have this global idea that is being fed people's consciousness, what are we like a year in now? And the main focus of this particular entity is fear, specifically fear of death, right? So what we have really is a death egregore that is infecting everybody's minds, regardless of egregores and thought forms work the same way. That's a lot of power in so many consciousnesses, feeding it, paying attention to it, watching it having their awareness uh, focused upon it. I'm also afraid that owing to just cultural changes, which are really unrelated to the epidemic, we are living now in a very, very highly secularized and consequently really unspiritual society. And so this would be definitely an opportunity for spiritual awakening, but when the uh, inclinations of the people are not in that direction, then that opportunity is likely to be wasted. If these forces are in one way or another crippled, man becomes psychologically crippled. And the moment this happens, we observe around us that man sickens inwardly. And to the degree that he sickens inwardly, he destroys the integrity of his environment. What I learned this last year is that a surprising amount of people have never had to confront their fear of death and deal with their relationship with fear and with death. And this was the first time that they were presented that and they didn't do a good job. The way that you shake off a death egregore is sadly that you have to conquer your fear of death. <laughs> so, piece of cake, right? Here is my cemetery plot, right here, that we bought soon after my diagnosis. When my doctor told me that I may have two months to 24 months to live, we called the town hall and found if there were any plots available next to our other relatives here in the cemetery and we were fortunate enough to get a few right here. And this is month number 70, and I still haven't needed the cemetery plot, which says something itself right there. But it's here at the ready, under a beautiful purple rhododendron tree, is my plot. The journey through the dark night can be long and arduous. As strong as my father's spiritual conviction was, there were still moments where his face appeared tense as he undoubtedly questioned his own beliefs. This is only natural during moments of fear. Here's one of our residents who has just passed away, and he was in a lot of pain and agony, and this is kind of a blessing that we see that he has passed on, and the staff has asked me to come in and pray over him. So I just came back from the hospital, they asked me to come in when they uh, wanted to take some biopsies of the tumors that seemed to be growing in my prostate and maybe in my bladder. Now this is something I had no idea. I may have um, a kidney malfunction. So it's interesting how this particular exploratory, when they were trying to find out what types of tumors were growing and where they were growing, they may have found that I had limited or a total um, unfunctioning, non-functioning kidney from the, re the results of this particular test that they just did. It was his belief that the power of prayer kept him alive longer than the doctor's initial prognosis. On his journey, he rarely allowed negative forces to drag him down. 
I can see where this business could be fun, Bill. It's interesting. In an odd, in an odd way, this could be fun it, business. It's interesting. It's it's less morbid than people make it out to be. <laughs> no, you make it fun. No, it, you I'm know, kind of looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's much less morbid than people think it is. It appeared he had the wisdom within, though he never said it out loud, to overcome and succumb in harmony. Now, what's his name? Uh, how do you give him a name? Uh, Brownie. A brownie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here's Linus the king. Oh, yeah, that's Chico. Chico? Chico. You sure have an awful lot of friends. The correlations in our paths resided in the fact that we're both seekers, though I didn't know it at the time. Though unlike him, I found myself surrounded by these significant spiritual locations to seek answers, whereas he walked alone. Here in this neighborhood, it appears there were and continue to be many trails up the same mountain. And at its peak lies wisdom. I truly believe that my father would have made an expert guide on any one of those trails. need of human nature and we cannot deny our humanity we cannot deny our own soul we it might be obscured for a while but it, it will come back you can chase out nature with a pitchfork but it will come right back in, in the same way you can chase out the esoteric but it always pops up because it, it originates in human nature itself We will ask the land why it thinks people gather here in this place and see what their response is. So for the I Ching, I use these coins, um, which my friend got me in China. They're around 300 years old. I like the way they sound. <laughs> so I'll do the casting. We will ask the land what it is and why people come here. What does it have for them? This is a very interesting answer that we have received. We got hexagram 44 with no lines changing. I call hexagram 44 the devil because it is the ego game. The reason I call it the devil, which I explain in my book, is because it's where someone wants to make their mark. In Dr. Karcher's book, uh, Total I Ching, he calls it the heir, and it shows a woman giving birth, which is like your legacy. And what I was shown was that it's kind of like the Tower of Babel, and how humans are trying to leave a monument or erect some kind of evidence that they were here by leaving their name on it. It's like how coyotes piss to show their territory. But does it belong to them? It does not. The reason Cain was given his mark is because he refused to give acknowledgement to the land and to creator and to God and spirit and instead took all of the um, credit himself, right? He shows his harvest of the food to spirit and says, look at what I made, look at what my hands have done, the work that my hands have done. And spirit was like, you made stuff with stuff I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> 
this land is trying to let us know that it is not about the ego. So those of us that are in Hollywood trying to leave our legacy, trying to leave our mark upon the land, you are doing it wrong. Please, to heal Hollywood, we must lift the land back up and our egos down. But the other part of it was they told me graven images, okay? Graven images, they said, was to write your name upon a grave or a monument to show that you had been here. This is an ego person. <laughs> this does not give veneration to creator, it gives veneration to Pharaoh. Hmm. Who created Pharaoh? Right? We must honor the land, we must honor spirit. It's about more than just um, placing our names um, in cellulose, right? Or, or on sidewalks. <laughs> or on sidewalks. That gave me goosebumps. It's the same story over and over. Maybe Hollywood is here to show us the drama and the story, right? In order that we may graduate from it. If Hollywood is the embodiment of the mark of Cain, it's shown for all the world to see so that it comes out of shadow and can be seen on every screen. <laughs> If you are that intent on trying to find something, and then eventually <laughs> you will. The land remembers.